Welcome to Raven Talk, the official podcast of the Raven Tribe. The Raven Tribe is a home for warriors on the path and is dedicated to training warriors for the battlefield of life. Visit us on the web at theraventribe.com where you can learn more information on membership, warrior training, as well as links to our official YouTube channel, Facebook group, apparel store, and our official bookstore, Marshall Books. Welcome back, Tribe. Today we have a special guest, Maxime Schwina, and we're going to be discussing Irish martial arts, specifically Irish stick fighting. Maxime, how are you today? I'm very good. Are you? Good, good. Glad to have you on the show. I'm very happy to have you here and be able to give us some information on a variation of martial arts from Europe that doesn't get always a lot of attention. Uh, I find it fascinating. I've been on your, your website and looked at your article. They're very well done, and it really sparked my interest. So I'm glad to have you here so you can share this information with the audience. Um, before we get started, can you introduce yourself a little bit to the audience? Just give us a brief background of who you are as a trainer and as a researcher. Sure. Uh, so uh, I'm uh, Maxime Chouinard. I'm uh, originally from Quebec. Uh, so I, I, my, my first language is French, but uh, I've, I've learned to speak English since I was a, a, a small kid. Uh, and I started uh, martial arts about maybe 20 years ago. I uh, started a little bit of boxing with my dad when I was young. And then I got introduced to uh, karate, uh, Kyokushin karate, um, which was one of the only arts that was available where I'm from. And uh did that for about eight years. Um, went to train in Japan uh, a little bit. Uh, and when I went to college and university, I uh, started doing Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And then I started doing kenjutsu as well. So that, that sparked an interest in, in weapons for me. Uh, and from then I started like training in different arts. I discovered HEMA, so historical European martial arts. I started doing a little bit of saber from manuals, a little bit of boxing. Uh, and in 2007, I uh, traveled to Ireland. And then I met with a, a gentleman over there that uh, uh, taught us uh, Irish stick fighting uh, to me and my, my brother-in-law. And uh, that's uh, since then I've been practicing and started teaching uh, the art as well um, here in uh, Kingston, Ontario. Now, Maxine, can you tell us a little bit about Irish stick fighting in general? Um, what era in time is it coming from? You know, these methods that you that you're training and researching. What type of people were using you know these weapons, and, and what was the overall kind of social context of of the development of this fighting system? Sure. So. Irish stick fighting, uh, we don't really know exactly where it comes from. Uh, there's no, like, there's, there, of course, there's no uh, historical documents about uh, the origins of the art, and there's no, there's not even any kind of legends about who uh, created it, you know, like a, some kind of legendary hero or whatever. Uh, but we do know that Irishmen used clubs and sticks uh, from very early on and starting about the in the 18th century you start to hear about a thing called faction fights and that's also when you start hearing and reading a little bit more about Irish stick fighting and so what was happening is that uh, you had clans or groups of Irishmen that were meeting uh, certain occasions and having uh, fights between them uh, so it could be for a variety of reasons. It could be uh, for political reasons. It could be for um, feuds. Uh, it could be for just plain fun. It could be uh, done for weddings, funerals, uh, fairs. Uh, and, and even though people were dying in those fights, uh, it was still considered fun. Uh, so people had a very different idea of uh, uh, fun back then. <laughs> And um, for a long time, if you killed somebody during one of those fights, you would not be prosecuted uh, because it was seen as kind of a, a legitimate um, kind of fun activity. Um, and so the the art kind of uh, sprouted from these uh, these fights, and because people were using those canes quite a lot, uh, of course, because. Uh, maybe swords were seen as just a little bit too hardcore for faction fights, but also because there were laws 
against the uh, the possession of weapons mostly targeted at uh, Irish Catholics and we believe that that also played a role in the popularity of Irish stick fighting and many families have their own styles of Irish stick fighting um, ours comes from uh, Northern Ireland from Antrim County and you had uh, other styles uh, that were taught by professional teachers that were called uh, fencing masters uh, they had schools um, in different towns, and uh, it was very interesting. Uh, we There's one story about how uh, a specific school, I think it was around uh, Limerick uh, or Tipperary, uh, attracted students. So they would have this, uh, this rack of sticks outside the school on the street, and uh, with a student standing next to it. And whenever somebody was coming up and taking a look at the stick, the student would ask, well, do you know how to use them? And if the other person said yes, then they would fight. And, of course, if the student uh, won, then he would say, well, how about you come in the school and we teach you how to use it for real. Uh, so that was one way to get some students uh, out from the street. Uh, not something that we, we do anymore today, uh, I'm afraid, but... Uh, there's there's been kind of a, a renaissance now about Irish stick fighting um, in the the late 90s, early 2000s. People started having an interest in this again, and there's about two traditional styles that came up: the Doyle family and the Ramsey family, which is the style that we teach. Now, Maxime, is there a, a social uh, economic aspect to who was training these weapons? Was it something of the upper classes, lower classes, middle class? Or was it across the board, everybody was, you know, putting hands on these type of weapons? So it was mostly the lower classes that would have been doing this, mostly the uh, uh, farmers, workers, uh, and most of the time in rural um, locations, uh, especially in 19th century. Uh, you don't see a lot of these fights going on in big cities like Dublin. And there's an interest from the higher classes, uh, which is mostly, uh, they, they mostly saw this as a uh, curiosity. Um, there's not a lot of, uh, of uh, I would say, uh, uh, merchants or political figures that were known to take part in faction fights, although some of them supposedly knew a little bit about it. But it was definitely more the art of the people, um, and it started to be quite repressed uh, starting in the mid-19th century um, more for many, many uh, complex reasons, uh, but mostly because it, uh, the people consider that it, um, uh, it, it projected a bad image of the Irish people. Uh, you know, that of the Irish uh, drunken brawler, violent, and uh, uh, that couldn't quite handle its own uh, its own destiny. So a lot of people were uh, trying to repress Irish stick fighting and instead promoting more uh, uh, civilized, if we will, uh, sports, uh, such as uh, hurling, for example. Now, the... Art was taught, you said, in, in some places in schools and other places within families. How um, – I find it to be a lot with uh, with some of these cultural arts that they are often not codified. Some of the systems that I've looked at and, and people I've interviewed – you know, tell me that it's more of a collection of tricks. Others say, no, there's a very, you know, formalized way of learning. What's been your experience in your research? Is it one or the other or kind of a combination of the two? Well, it's hard to say because I would never really know how they were taught in actual schools. Uh, but the way I was taught the art uh, was from uh, my, my teacher who learned it from his father and his father before him. And I guess when you're in a family setting, you know, you don't necessarily need that much of a formal way of learning because you're always just gravitating around your, your dad and he's teaching you all these techniques as it goes. So there was, uh, there was no, um, at least from what I understand, there was no uh, like a, a real curriculum, uh, a standard curriculum that you had to go through. Uh, you would you would learn all these techniques and uh, mostly uh, one by one using uh, either drills or sparring. 
so it's it's definitely not as hierarchical as you would find in karate or things like that. But um, I think this is also because this is in like kind of pre-industrial martial art, and the martial arts became really formalized as, as we know them today. I think mostly uh, starting in the 19th century and 20th century when you, you started to, to teach a large number of students and suddenly you couldn't put as much attention to uh, specific students so you needed something a little bit more uh, systematic. Now, when you have trained in the art, um, can you t first tell us a little bit about how you became trained, where you discovered it, you know, what the system was that you began learning? Yeah. Uh, so when I... Uh, when I traveled to Ireland, I asked my my brown law uh, to follow me, and I had learned uh, that Irish stick fighting existed. Uh, I, I knew there were some discussion groups about it online, and I heard people talking about it. And in my mind, I thought that okay, there must be if I go to Ireland, there must be a couple of schools there teaching it. Um, so I started asking people online, and they would say, well. You know, uh, well, go see this guy, and they gave me the uh, the contact of uh, my teacher there, John, and I emailed him, and uh, so I he said, uh, okay, sure, yeah, when you when you come in, I'll I'll show you what I know. Uh, so we we traveled there, we stayed there for about three months, and uh, we we met with John, and during our travel, very early on, we were talking to people in Ireland about this, and we realized that okay, no, this is really not something that is well known or common or anything like this. Um, a lot of people had heard about Irish stick fighting. Most people considered it uh, barbaric. Uh, some people were interested by it too. Um, but there uh, there was a lot of, uh, and there still is, a lot of uh, um, say a misunderstanding about what it is exactly. A lot of people said, oh, it's just like two guys hitting each other in the head with sticks, uh, which is much, much more than that. Uh, but anyway, so so we met with, with John, and he taught us the techniques. And when it was time to go, he told us, well, you know, guys, if you ever want to uh, teach this art, uh, you have my permission to do so. Uh, and he says, because, like, my kids don't really have an interest in, in learning it. Uh, people around me don't really have an interest either. And when you come back to Ireland, like in 15 years, uh, it might just have completely dis disappeared from the, uh, the, uh, the aisle. So uh, we felt kind of like, you know, uh, <laughs> like I said at the time, we, we felt like the last Jedi, you know, like, okay, we have this knowledge with us. And uh, if we don't do anything with it, then it'll just disappear. Uh, so we started uh, teaching slowly in, in Quebec, and we opened up our school there. And since then, it's been slowly growing. Uh, there's a lot of interest, uh, a lot of people writing to me like, oh, where can I find a school to, to, to learn this? Uh, but uh, unfortunately, it's still very rare, even though we're working hard to get some, some schools set up. Uh, now, can you tell me a little bit about what you learned in the system uh and is there my, my other question is is there a proper name for the system that you learned mm -hmm. so the the name the of our system the, well we call it antrim antrim uh, stick fighting uh so from the the region it's from uh there was no specific name to it uh originally again because it was an art that was passed down from father to son and there was never any, uh, uh, I guess, any need to find a specific name uh, for it. Um, so that's that's the name we came up with. And we uh, so so some of the techniques that we we're taught uh, there there's about I think about maybe 40 different strikes uh, that we learned. Uh, and many other parries, so everything is is very um, established. So there's no, I would say there's no, it's not a very structured way of learning, but there's definitely uh, techniques uh, that are, uh, um, I would say, uh, definitely 
much more structure, much more uh, uh, defined. So you, you learn the guards, you learn the, the parries, you learn the footwork, and it's very, it's a dirty fighting. So there's no rules to these engagements. Uh, you can learn how to uh, kick uh, to any, uh, any place in the body. You would learn to poke the eyes, uh, smash the throat. Uh, so it's a, it's a style, you know, that and anything goes. Uh, so that, uh, it's, uh, again, it's a, it's a product of its time uh, where people were not really concerned about uh, rules so much. Uh, or sport. Now, was this a system that was taught primarily for one-on-one -on -one fighting? Or is, is there an application for multiple attackers? And is it? It sounds like it's based mostly on striking techniques. Is there any element of grappling with the stick involved in the training? So it's mostly uh, uh, it's mostly strikes. You do have a, a little bit of wrestling, but the uh, uh, we have to understand that the aim of this system was to learn to fight in faction fights, uh, which is a situation where you don't necessarily want to be grappling too much because if you end up on the ground, uh, then the friends of your 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 opponent are just going to come around and polish their boots and, and your face. Uh, so you want to be standing up as much as much as possible. Um, so you learn to fight against single opponents, but uh, the overall rationale is that you are in a fight with multiple opponents and you have to be able to move around uh, to uh, cover yourself from different directions and be aware of your uh, your surroundings. Uh, so uh, right now we teach, we, we start to teach beginners mostly one-on-one -on -one fights and as they become more comfortable, then we start doing group fights and building up to even faction fights. Now, have you made any adjustments to the way that you teach it to other people? Have you maybe you know worked out curriculum a little bit differently than, uh, like you mentioned before, the family to family is is one way of teaching. But if you're opening up a school and teaching, you know, the masses, I would imagine you might need to make some adjustments there. Um, what's been your experience with that? Absolutely. So I. Um, when I started teaching, I tried to stay as close as possible to the original way of passing it down. And whenever I'm teaching it to individuals, that's, that's what I try to do. But as you say, when you're teaching to groups, suddenly that approach doesn't work as well anymore because you cannot, you have to divide your attention between so many people. And especially when you start opening schools all around, you want to make sure that what is being taught is the same or relatively the same from school to school. Uh, so I came up with sets of drills um, and a, a more uh, uh, codified way of uh, learning how to use the six. You must have started with, uh, with footwork, uh, guards, uh, learning very basic parries, basic strikes, and moving on from... Uh, to more what I consider more advanced techniques from from then on. Now, speaking of the techniques, for the benefit of the audience that may have never seen any you know type of Irish stick work, you, and you have a background, and I've seen you know a lot of your articles on other stick methods, especially from Europe. What have you found to be some of the notable differences, if if you can expound on that a little bit, um, that might be different from what we see in, say, Filipino martial arts or maybe like French cane. What is unique about the Irish stick work from your perspective? Sure. So I think that the biggest difference is the guard. And I really haven't seen anything like it in most martial arts, uh, most stick fighting martial arts I've seen. Uh, the, the grip is uh, you grab your stick from about the third uh, the length, and you have to have the, the lower part of your stick go past your elbow about an inch. Uh, your thumb is sticking up, and you must bring the stick around eye level, very close to your head. So what it does is that it um, allows you to have an aggressive stance, so you're always ready to strike from above, but it also protects you because the, the lower part of your stick will cover your forearm and your elbow. 
So it's something that, you know, you're you're into this uh, very defensive but also very aggressive stance. Whereas in, in most stick styles, you kind of to make a compromise whenever you're taking a guard. That's uh, whether I'm am I'm in the a more uh, aggressive guard or I'm in more defensive guard. In this system, you're about you're you're allowed to do both at the same time, and um, also the the types of strikes that were were taught. It's a very polyvalent style, so you can learn to manage different. Um, different uh, uh, ranges of attack. So you can use the whole stick as you would in French can, for example, um, to cover a wide distance, or you can use it more classically in the uh, the mid range, and even attack from very close range uh, using kind of a. Uh, for those who are familiar with uh, uh, more military methods like the Fairbairn method uh, stick fighting. So you have uh, something that looks a little bit like this where you're using, using your stick two-handed palms down and using it for really in close fighting. So I think that's one of the aspects that really differentiate at least our style from other styles of stick fighting I've seen. Now, can you tell me a little bit about the weapon itself being used? Is it, is it a heavy weapon? Is it a, you know, what's the average length on the weapon? Are there any you know guidelines for you know picking it up? I mean, is there a stick that's too short to be used with the style, or one too long to be used with the style? How do, how does it work with, as far as the weapon selection? So traditionally, from what I was told by my teacher, the the preferred length would be about four foot, but you can use the system with basically any length of stick that you can find. Ideally, it has to be a stick that's forward weighted. So it has to have some kind of a weight on top, like a knob or a, a ball or a, some some kind of a mass there. But you can also use it with a very straight stick, and um, even with very short stick. Of course, at 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 some point you have to sacrifice the defensive uh, capabilities of the lower hand of the stick. But you can still use pretty much the same system. So there's no, you know. The, Usually we prefer to use like walking stick, or cane length uh, uh, kind of sticks uh, because that's that's kind of a polyvalent length. It's something that you can uh, you can you can find in, in most uh, um, uh, most settings today, and it teaches you how to use a long or a, a short stick quite well. So there's. Uh, uh, there's this, but usually, traditionally, they would use uh, what we call shillelaghs uh, today. So they would be uh, like walking sticks uh, with a knob and made most commonly out of blackthorn. But it could also be oak, uh, holy, ash. Uh, so they would use different types of wood. And they would uh, usually fill the knob with lead so that the uh, the stick would be a little bit a little bit more uh, dangerous in the strikes, and that kind of modifies the amount of power you have to give uh, in a strike. So usually, when you have a like a, a flat even stick, uh, you need to have a lot of power in order to do damage. But if you have this knob on top, suddenly the the point of balance is very much forward. And it gives you a, um, a very dangerous stick, of course, uh, that can easily break bone. Uh, so you don't need as much power behind the strikes when you're using that that sort of stick. Now, is the system designed for specifically stick against stick, or is it applied stick against other weapons like knives or you know shorter clubs? How do you well, train it, and how was it originally envisioned? Well, I think mostly it was uh, it was envisioned as a stick against stick, but it it can be used, and it, we we do teach it against other kinds of um, of weapons, uh, like knives, for example. My 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 teacher told me that he it did have at some point to defend himself uh, against a. Uh, um, uh, an attacker with a knife and uh, broke his hand, uh, the the knife, the silence hand, 
and ended the fight like this. And that's one thing that he, he taught us how to do. Uh, so there's, um, again, it's it's a very polyvalent style. And I think as in many uh, Japanese swordmanship schools, once you learn how to defend yourself against the stick, uh, you can learn how to defend yourself against many other different kinds of weapons uh, because you you have an understanding of range, you have an understanding of what you stick can do. Um, so it's mostly a matter of uh, put it, uh, like grabbing these uh, uh, general principles and applying them to very different situations. So I've had experience fighting uh, different styles and I found that uh, I was able to use most of these uh, common things quite effectively. I've had students even fight against people with long sword, and they say that uh, they were able to make it work. And I found with people who use Kelly, who use knives, uh, and again, you know, it's uh, of course the uh, it's always the better fighter that's gonna uh, end up uh, prevailing. But um, I found that the system was very easy to adapt to these different situations. Well, I'm I'm glad you mentioned that because that was actually my next question was how if how the system stacks up against other weapon systems if you've never tried it or pressure tested it that way. So that's interesting that you've done that and you've had good success with it. Yes, I I went just this year to my first uh Dog Brothers gathering and it was quite an eye-opening experience. Um uh, most of course most of the guys over there do Kelly, uh, Screma, Krabi Karbong, and uh, they were really not used to uh, Irish stick fighting. Even having a stick of the length that I was using was quite, um, I say shocking, but it was quite alien to a lot of these, these guys. And um, I found that there were a lot of techniques that I was using that uh, they had no uh, equivalent so it was quite surprising for, for them. Of course, these guys train at a, a really high level. Like the, the conditioning they're, they're, they're doing is, is awesome. And uh, I, think I, I think I did a, a, a good impression, uh, but I, did, uh, I didn't came out unscathed. Of course, uh, there were some really uh, skilled opponents. Uh, but we ended up having a good time, and this was uh, saying a very eye-opening experience. Now, it, it sounds like this system would lend itself very well to self-defense. Do you teach it as a practical self-defense art, or do you teach it more as a, a, an art where you're preserving the history of the art? Well, I, I try to do a little bit of both. You know, uh, I think the, the historical part does not necessarily um, diminishes the self-defense aspect of it. Because we're still, you know, we're we're still uh, using the same techniques. Uh, I think the only thing that um, uh, as I say is a bit perplexing to people who approach it as a purely self-defense approach uh, is that it's it's not an art that you can learn uh, rapidly. Like in many self-defense systems, they'll tell you, oh, the like you can use these techniques. So they're very instinctual. I uh, can use it right away in the street after sort of learning them. Um, this this is not something that you can do in Irish stick fighting. It takes uh, a, a certain time to uh, interiorize the system, the techniques, and you do have to train uh, to get better. So it, it's, it's really different from what a lot of people uh, teach as uh, walking stick self-defense. But it's highly applicable. I'd say Probably the only difference is learning how to fight against uh, modern knife systems or uh, people with uh, using guns. But of course, that was not necessarily a, a reality back in, in 19th century Ireland. Uh, but it's something that you can apply still. Let me ask you, Maxim, if the art traveled with the Irish that emigrated to the United States, to, to Canada, do you have any um, information about that? Did the art come with them, or did it stay in Ireland, or and not really make that that transition here to the to the North American continent? Oh, yeah, it absolutely did. Uh, 
we do have a another system that is being taught here in Canada, which is the uh, the Doyle family system, and it was brought to Newfoundland uh, along with the uh, a member of the Doyle family, and it's still being being taught today uh, around Toronto, and I I have found mentions of uh, other styles that were brought over, but unfortunately died out. Uh, I have. Since I've published my articles online, I have so many people that emailed me from all over the world, you know, uh, telling me, oh, you know, I, after reading your article, I, um, I there's a light that uh, uh, opened in my, in my head. I was like, wow, this is exactly what my grand, grandfather was doing. You know, he would, he would just uh, go at a punching bag and do some stick work. And I always thought that, uh, he had learned this somewhere in the army or the police or something, but I had no idea this was, this was a traditional thing. Um, I, I met with some historians uh, who had uh, Irish uh, parents, and one of them told me uh, my father was very knowledgeable in stick fighting, but he didn't taught us. Uh, so because they were he only had girls, uh, unfortunately at that time you apparently didn't didn't teach girls how to fight with stick um and so the art again died out so there's there's many of these systems i hope that we'll be able to find more people that still have this knowledge and might be unaware of what they they have exactly and maxime what what are your efforts now to keep this system going to get more people introduced to it to make sure that it doesn't die out so what I, what I do is, of course, I teach out of uh, my school here in Kingston, uh, and I help uh, some of my students uh, set up their own classes uh, in other towns, other cities. Uh, I also travel to give seminars. Uh, there's many people who email me and say, oh, I'd like to learn it, but unfortunately I cannot travel. And we do have a an online um, uh, distance study program. Now that program does not allow somebody to teach the style, unfortunately, because as much as I would like the style to spread, uh, we still want to maintain uh, quality uh, and make sure that the people who teach the art are qualified and skilled enough to represent it. So when I have people who uh, contact me and say, oh, I'd really like to teach this style in my school, well, uh, I tell him well, one of the only way to do it is to come see me or see one of our uh, recognized instructors and spend some time training with them, and uh, then we'll we'll be able to judge if they're they're able to set up their own study groups, uh, and then maybe even become an instructor later on. And it's very you know I I'm not in this to do money. I uh, I do this for the the love of the art. Uh, there's no like federation fees or things like that, uh, at least for now, uh, since we're still a very small organization. Uh, and all I ask is for travel fees uh, to be paid. So I'm I really like this art to uh, uh, spread out more and be be more known. And I think it's, I think we're getting there slowly. People are getting more and more aware of of what the style is. Um, for example, when I was uh, competing or not competing, when I was fighting at the uh, uh, the Dog Brothers gathering last time, I was surprised at how many people actually knew of Irish stick fighting. Um, they they had never seen it, but they they knew oh yeah that that's a thing, and I think that's a nice uh, there's a step in the right direction that at least people are. Uh, the, the term Irish stick fighting is is becoming more and more uh, recognized. Now, Maxime, before we wrap up, I'd like to take a little bit of time and talk about some of the other things that you're working on. Now, you have a, a great blog. Uh, I don't do longsword is the name of your blog. Yes. Okay, and that's a reference to your exploration of HEMA arts, other obviously other than longsword. And yeah. I've I've found some great articles there. You're you're a very gifted writer. I really enjoy the work that you put up there. Tell us a little bit about the blog, the kind of things that you're featuring on there, and some of your other research aside from the Irish stick work. Sure. Uh, so my blog, as you say, is called I Don't Do Longsword. And um, as some of 
the, your listener may know, there's uh, in uh, historical European martial arts, the probably the most popular style of all is longsword. Uh, mostly German, also Italian from the 14 up to the 16th century. As people who uh, recreate these techniques based on manuals and uh, from the time, and I well, like the title says, I don't do longsword. I do other types of hema. I do saber, uh, pugilism. Uh, I do uh, Victorian self defense with a small sword. Uh, so I do many different kinds uh, of styles. But I thought that when I was visiting forums. Uh, when I was uh, hanging out in uh, discussion groups about HEMA, whenever a subject outside of like, medieval Renaissance uh, martial arts was raised, it was getting uh, just uh, drowned into uh, the, the more uh, usual discussions. Uh, and it, I, I think it, it really didn't help these arts to uh, propagate and be better known. So I set up this blog and said, okay, I'm going to do my best to illustrate a little bit more about these these other arts and how they're interesting in their own rights. Um, and that's all that, that expanded. And in, in a way, I started talking about uh, well, different um, uh, questions that were of interest to me, uh, more the, the, like the sociology aspect. Uh, so I work as a museum curator. I've studied cultural heritage quite a lot, and sociology is a very, very big part of it. So I, I started uh, talking about the nature of HEMA as a social phenomenon. It's a very interesting community. You know, very uh, um, uh, it's, it's very much a product of online culture, and also talking about uh, the, the sport aspect. Uh, what exactly the, the HEMA would be or wouldn't be, and uh, there, there's many interesting questions to be uh, to be explored around this. And Maxine, tell me about your upcoming works, because I understand you have a new translation project that you're that you're working on. What can you tell us about that? So yeah, I've got a couple of uh, manuals that I'm uh, uh, I'm in the process of translating. I think the probably the most interesting um, manual I'm, I'm translating at the moment is a uh, an 18th century military surgery manual uh, that, that was uh, written in French, and it's a massive work. Uh, it talks about, uh, there's two parts. First part is about gun uh, wounds, and the second part is about uh, blade wounds. And uh, so uh, some people might wonder how is it applicable to, to martial arts. Uh, but the, the way it was written by uh, uh, Mr. Rabaton, who was the author, uh, was a very experienced surgeon, military surgeon. And he described these cases really, really well in very, uh, very detailed format. And I think it, by, by, uh, by actually reading these excerpts, you learn a lot about how people fought and especially what were the uh, the most common injuries of the time um, and how they were treated or or, or not and how uh, how uh, deadly they could be. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a very uh, different but very interesting uh, uh, a, uh, vision into, uh, into fighting in, in the 18th century. I'm also working on uh, translating some uh, Lacan and some uh, Baton manual from France uh, from the 19th century. And I'm also in the process of writing a book about Irish stick fighting and more specifically about our style, uh, which we'll talk a little bit about the history, but which will expand also in some of the techniques uh, that, that I teach so that people might uh, better understand exactly what our style uh, is about. Well, very good. I look forward to seeing uh, the book, especially the book on the Irish stick fighting in print. Uh, again, to the audience at home, I want to highly recommend the, the blog. It's got some amazing articles on there, a lot of good research and information. Uh, you can simply Google, I don't do longsword, or you can visit hemamisfits.com to find this gentleman's work online. 
And, uh, sir, I want to thank you for being part of the show today. It was very enlightening, very great to talk to you and to learn a little bit about a very um, unknown martial art. And I'm glad that you're there doing the work, putting this out there into the community and uh, raising the awareness and making sure that this piece of martial history doesn't get lost to time. Oh, thank you. Thanks, thanks for having me. It was, uh, it was a pleasure. Thank you, sir.